I am going to now, it is my great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Ed Ray, President, Oregon State University, start a program. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Deb. I appreciate the opportunity to welcome you here this morning for the second annual Government Open Source Conference. Let me start by thanking uh, Deb Bryant for her work in organizing the conference and Kurt Pedersen, OSU's Chief Information Officer, for the leadership he provides in the arena, not only here at OSU, but in, throughout OUS and, in fact, across the state. As Oregon's land-grant university, OSU is engaged in many fields. In fact, I occasionally remind friends and alumni of the university that I may be the only person in Oregon running an enterprise that includes a nuclear reactor, supercomputers, a fleet of ocean-going research vessels, a tsunami wave lab, eight research forests, a football stadium, which we talk about more or less depending on the uh, times, a herd of cows, Shakespearean stage costumes, and a Steinway concert grand piano. Nevertheless, I'm convinced that our work in open source software holds the potential for some of our greatest contributions to our state, our nation, and the world. In this regard, I note that we're joined today by attendees from 18 states and from a number of uh, countries as close as Canada and as far away as uh, India, and we're delighted to have all of them here. One of the things we pride ourselves on at OSU is our engagement with the world, so we're pleased to see so many international participants. I traveled this summer to Japan, China, Taiwan, Thailand. Japan and China are also represent, have representatives here today, incidentally. And I was struck throughout my travels by the prominence of our graduates in Asian educational institutions and economies. For instance, at Cassettsart University in Bangkok, I learned that three of the 13 presidents have come from Oregon State University. On this trip, I also signed new partnership agreements between OSU and 10 Asian institutions, including the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And incidentally, the Director General of the Chinese Academy of Sciences studied oceanography at Oregon State University as well. We now have 150 international educational partnerships. This means the work we do in open source can readily be distributed from here to serve the world. In fact, we're already doing this quite actively. We average four million downloads a day from the open source lab, and we provide assistance to 78 separate open source projects. When I was at Ohio State, before becoming to the real OSU, I was the university's first chief information officer. This is not an assignment that economists get very often, probably for very good reasons. At the time, no one knew how to integrate information systems to meet enterprise-wide needs, and none of the vice presidents trusted one of their own number to do the job properly. So I was the compromise candidate. I imagine they figured that my learning curve would, would be flat enough that it would be a long time before I could do any real damage. At the time, I took this assignment, and I know all of you are more familiar with these circumstances than I am. Proprietary software was emerging as the solution to, mount, to surmounting the problems inherent with standalone legacy systems within and across institutions. Some of these proprietary software packages proved to be very profitable, something even economists understand, and they gathered momentum and market share. But as you know too well, they also created problems of their own, not the least of which was the high cost and frequency of upgrades. Today, open source offers the possibility and increasingly the reality of having multiple organizations and agencies engaged in development of a major system on a shared basis, generating constant improvement for the good of the community in a very cost-effective way. 
In this arrangement, everyone has the potential of getting a more robust system at a lower cost, the very definition of a win-win. For these reasons and others, open source has tremendous promise for governments, public and private institutions, and for the world's citizens. Through open source, our students, staff, and faculty have a unique opportunity to make a difference for society, the very essence of a land-grant mission. Open source also serves our educational goals. The many OSU students who work in the open source lab gain unmatched real world experience as they help manage some of the largest open source projects in the world. So there are three observations I want to share with you this morning. OSU is deeply committed to open source as an expression of the land grant mission in the 21st century. We have the technology and, a world, and worldwide networks to promulgate open source software to the governmental, non-private, and higher education communities around the world. And our work in open source provides our students and faculty an unmatched opportunity to work on the cutting edge of the global information age. Before introducing our next speaker, let me just thank you again for attending GOSCON and assure you that we are delighted to be partners with you as we all work together to make a real difference. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Eric Stenium, the Science and Technology Advisor to Oregon Governor Ted Kulangoski. Eric is here in Oregon as an executive on loan from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is also one of our leading partners in the ONAMI Signature Research Project. Eric's responsibilities at Pacific Northwest National Lab include creating new technology-based ventures and building partnerships with Northwest institutions to enhance science and technology collaboration and to expand knowledge-based economic development. Today, he share, shares that expertise with Oregon leadership in public and private industry, as well as higher education. Eric, thank you for joining us for the second annual Government Open Source Conference. Please, all of you, join me in welcoming Eric Stenium. <laughs> Thank you, Ed, for those, uh, those very kind remarks. Um, it's interesting that the, uh, the opening session should start off with two economists. I mean, who'd have guessed? Uh, as you're all aware, in his book, uh, The World is Flat, A Brief History of the 21st Century, Thomas Friedman delves into the phenomena that are reshaping the economic, cultural, and political landscapes of the world. Friedman describes how accelerated change is made possible through intersecting technologies and social protocols. The results, cell phones, the internet, and open source. Friedman actually points to 10 flatteners that are responsible for, global, for this global phenomenon. Apropos to our meeting here today is flattener number four, which is not, hard, not easy to say, but it's, it's open sourcing, self-organizing, collaborative communities. And oh, by the way, one of your keynote speakers today, um, uh, Brian Bellendorf, was, uh, was interviewed uh, in this chapter of Friedman's book. In a flat world, the value creation model is moving away from vertical silos to increasingly collaborative horizontal value creation models. From command and control to collaborate and connect. And that's open source. And the implications and the opportunities for government and for government IT are just beginning to be explored and exploited. And I think that's one of the major purposes of the meeting here today. In his opening comments, Dr. Ray shared the, uh, the geographic diversity of today's attendance uh, or today's attendees. But you might consider as well the diverse communities of interest that are represented here and the segments of government that are represented here. We have representatives from transit, transportation, corrections, 
conservation, forestry, economic development, and justice, and more. We have representatives of public and private universities. We have municipal, county, state, federal, and foreign government uh, administrations represented here. And finally, we have the traditional and new vendors of IT services. These are the folks that support the business of innovation and of information technology, which, when effectively delivered, provides value to the citizens touched by each of these government segments. Without, without the limitation of, com of having to compete with each other for customers, I would suggest to you that governments are on the front edge of the curve, the, the, uh, the bleeding edge of the curve, on embracing the horizontal value creation model. And with their extensive investments in information technology, they can, and I think will, dramatically affect the way in which industry develops and acquires software going forward. In a separate interview, Friedman was once asked, do you know anyone in government uh, that is familiar with the concept of world flattening? Friedman's answer was flatly, no. Looking out at this room today, I would suggest that you stand on the threshold of changing that notion that you stand on the threshold of uh, changing the notion that governments don't understand or embrace world flattening. The second annual government open source conference has convened some of the best and brightest to share the possibilities of collaboration and innovation in IT. You can look forward to hearing from a number of experts, luminaries, and practitioners over the next two days. They're going to ask you to join the conversation. I would encourage you to get involved, to bring your own experiences to the table so that you get the most out of this session. And with that, I'd like to introduce your keynote speaker. It's been my pleasure to work with Stuart Cohen since my arrival in Oregon uh, last year. Stuart is the Chief Executive Officer of the Open Source Development Lab and along with running OSDL, which uh, incidentally is considered an anchor tenant in Oregon's open technology economic sector. Stuart devotes many, many hours to bringing together the public and the private sectors to energize their interests in and uh, to energize their leadership of the open source community. Please join me in welcoming Stuart Cohen. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. And as well, uh, welcome to Portland and welcome to Oregon. Uh, I really appreciate everybody coming out to this conference this year. Uh, this conference got started last year. We think there's tremendous momentum, obviously, around open source, around the opportunities for governments and for governments to get involved in those activities. And we think what's going on here in Oregon uh, really sets us apart and sets us apart globally for the activities that are happening around the world. And I think we're really uniquely positioned to bring value to what's going on to the open source community, to what's going on in government agencies. And I'm gonna be spending a little bit of time this morning talking a little bit about that, as well as kind of what's going on around the world, the state of the state, if you will, and then a little bit about what's going on in Oregon and how I think in some cases we're really leading, and in other cases we're really looking to reach out and partner and get more actively involved in what's going on globally. So, this is a chart that just talks a little bit about how, how OSTL got started. And the interesting point about it was, in a very, very short time ago, about five, five and a half years ago, those seven companies got together. And the seven companies got together for really one particular reason, which was 
the Linux development community around the world really didn't trust vendors at all. And the vendors were seeing Linux starting to have great success around the world. And what the vendors wanted to see was would this scale, okay? Would it scale? Would it run on medium-sized computers? Would it run on large computers? Would it run on supercomputers? How would the scalability work? How would the performance work? How would the security work? But the interesting problem was, at the time, most of the developers did not work for those vendors. Most of the developers were independent. And interestingly enough, there was not much trust between those vendors and between those developers, as you would imagine. The other interesting part about it was they got together, they formed this nonprofit organization where they put money in a pot, if you will, and created a set of server farms where the development community could test their code. And they could test that code, as I said, small, medium, large equipment, both in the United States, here in Portland, as well as in Tokyo, Japan. The fascinating part about it is when you listen to what Ed Ray had to say about what was going on at Oregon State, none of that existed five, six years ago. So if you talk about what has happened in a very, very short period of time, if the equipment had been at Oregon State and the number of downloads he talked about and the number of projects that he talked about, OSDL from a scalability standpoint to the development community would not have existed. And if you look out around the world now, the vendors have gotten very, very active. They have hired a tremendous number of developers. Students have gotten very, very active in what's going on. The information technology professionals have gotten very involved in the development of open source software and the deployment of open source software. And it has changed the landscape dramatically in the last few years. And I think it's interesting because it was the number one reason five and a half, six years ago that OSDL got formed was around scalability and hardware testing. And when you now look at what is at Oregon State and when you look at our other various vendor situations, university situations, government situations, there's now thousands and thousands of servers made available to the open source community. And it's hard to fathom that five years ago when we were talking about Y2K, there was no hardware available for any of the open source developers to use. And, it, it, and I think it just, it gives you an opportunity to kind of step back and see how quickly this has moved and how quickly this is happening and how quickly books like The World is Flat gets written and the role it starts to have, not only in software development and the paradigm around software, but also the way people use software and I think how things have shifted from the role of the vendors to the role of the developers to the role of the customers. And we'll spend some time talking about that. We've obviously changed a lot as an organization in those years, but it's, uh, it's interesting as, as Ed talks about what they have, I just wanted to make the connection that that was the sole purpose for forming this organization five and a half years ago. Now it has changed pretty dramatically. Uh, now we have a, a broad set of members that are involved. We now have uh, an office in China. We're now involved in a variety of different activities. But what once started as testing only has really now led to a series of work groups, a series of legal activities, business issues, market activities all around the world. And it's of note that all of these companies are now participating in this, and they're participating in it mostly because the market is growing and is growing at such a rapid rate. And the fact that they come together here in Oregon, we have a work group meeting going on uh, actually just down the street where we've got about 100 people from about 25 different companies here over the next couple of days looking at requirements and looking at issues around data center activity, around desktop activity, around cell phones and smartphones, and around carrier grade or wireless infrastructure activities. And I think it just points to the leverage that I think we have here in Oregon and the opportunity to bring people together to work on these issues and to begin to start using pieces of the open source model around community, around collaboration. So let me talk a little bit today about the software market a little bit what we call the changing tide, and then some new opportunities uh, for government and some existing things that are going on. So if you look at today's software market, it's interesting, I was just at an enterprise software conference uh, earlier this week, and the whole conference was about 
you know, software as a service, enterprise 2.0, open source activities, the business models that are changing for software. How is software delivered? How is software developed? How do customers pay for software? How do they participate in development communities? How do they collaborate? Everything about that, interestingly enough, all leads to opportunities for open source software. Now, that wasn't an open source conference. That was a conference put together by a series of VCs and a series of CIOs and a series of very big software companies, most of which that you know still have and will probably have for some period of time a lot of proprietary software offerings to go along with a larger and growing number of open source software that they bring to the market at the same time. And we'll spend some time talking about that. But at the end of the, at the, end of the conference, 250 people, uh, one of the speakers stood up on stage and asked the question, so what do you think will be the biggest impact to the software market in the next two years? And the choices were up there, you know, software as a service and software-oriented architecture, open source, new, new software business models. And far and away, the number one thing that was picked in the group was the new software business models because they are all looking at new ways of doing this. And Linux, I think, has accomplished a great deal there. You know, Linux was really the operating system that came out of the community that brought validity and brought a lot of customer confidence, if you will, that it's okay to use open source software, it's okay to begin to deploy open source software. People had tremendous success with Linux, and they're very quickly wanting to talk about Linux is good enough, right? And now it's time to talk about a broad set of open source software. And it's not just limited to uh, infrastructure and middleware. Now open source software is moving very dramatically into the application area. And we'll spend some more time talking about that. But it's an interesting dilemma. It's a dilemma where some developers are working on very interesting applications for end users or for enterprises or for individuals. But in a lot of cases, what people want for application development and for applications, there is no development community for. So we have a unique opportunity to literally begin and start communities around areas of activity that we're most interested in. And I think that's a completely appropriate for the government industries in general, where so many things are done in so many different places around the world and done relatively the same way. So there's tremendous opportunity where Budgets are in place, needs are there, requirements are there, and there's a great opportunity to begin to create your own communities and begin to collaborate and begin to do joint development and begin to share resources and share the risks associated with that. But I think it's a tremendous financial incentive as well as a tremendous productivity and performance and security and availability options that open source brings to that. And the VCs are seeing that. You're seeing tremendous investment from VCs. The VC uh, investments in open source have doubled in the, last 12, in the last six months, from six months before that. And the anticipation of uh, a number of VCs in this conference that I attended earlier this week was that the number would more than double next year from where it is this year. And they thought the average investment would more than double as well. So they're seeing significant more investment by a broader number of VCs on a broader set of open source topics. All in mind, how does it work with the new business model? But I think it creates a real opportunity for us. The other pieces that have really driven that, if you look at the Linux operating system, as I said, it's about 20% of the market share of servers today. So from a, from a deployment standpoint, it's pretty consistent around the world. It's not like there's big pockets of they're all global 2,000 companies in the US, or they're all small and medium-sized companies in Europe. It, it is pretty consistent around the world. And as I said, the open source software has really become uh, a catalyst for a lot of this activity. And there's such confidence in the operating system, it's led to a variety of projects, a variety of applications continuing to move into this space. And the questions have changed. You know, two years ago, our customer advisory councils really wanted to know if they should do it. And now the question is really how. What are the best practices? What are the policies? How do we come together? How do we work on it? How do we begin to share? How do we work with the community? Uh, that's probably the biggest question I get all the time. How do I interface with the development community if I'm a company 
small, medium, large? If I'm a systems integrator or a vendor, how do I work with the community? How do I make sure I get off on the right foot? How do I make sure I do the things that are politically correct? How, how do I share code? How do I use code? How do I modify code? How do I provide services and support and education and training? And how do I do it in a collaborative fashion with the development community? Because it's a whole new model for people. And once again, down on the bottom, it's really because for the first time, the customers are really in control. It's not as much of a what will I get from my vendor on the schedule of my vendor? When will I get the fixes from my vendor? It's really becoming how do the customers look at what software is available, what communities out there, how are they building software, how are they developing software? And it's becoming an interesting paradigm shift in the way vendors are coming to the market and solutions are being brought to the market. And, it, and it, it, it's not to say that the world is going to move from proprietary software to open source software overnight. What it's really saying is customers are really looking for unique value. You know, customers have always had a situation where what they look at is, you know, what are the problems I have and how do I best find a solution to meet my needs? And people are willing to pay. People are willing to pay big premiums. And whether you're government agencies or whether you're customers of small and medium businesses, large businesses, whether you're cities or states, the opportunity is there and the people are looking for their unfair competitive advantage. And I think where they need that, that's very, very important. But there's tremendous opportunity to leverage, I think, a commonality of software that everyone needs to use, that everyone needs to work on. And then you have the opportunity to spend your resources, your precious resources in most cases, on really the things that differentiate you. Differentiate you either from a feature and function standpoint, from a localization standpoint, from a language standpoint, that really gives you the difference in your, in your specific environment. So this was a study that was put together um, a couple of months ago that talked about the reason people move to Linux. And I think what's interesting about it is if you look at the top five things, uh, they are different. Uh, and they are different from the standpoint it wasn't like one was 95%. What you see is a pretty consistent flow of different reasons why people were motivated to use Linux. And what I think that leads to is a broad set of reasons why people are looking at open source software. Some are around cost, uh, some are around reliability, some are around performance. You know, I was with a, uh, an agency uh, about four months ago that had a mainframe computer. and They were running Linux and a couple of open source software packages on it. And uh, on the particular mainframe environment, I asked them where they get their service from. And they said, we don't have any service on this. And I said, you're, you're running your mainframe computer and it's running a Linux distribution with some open source software and you have no service from anybody. And they said, no, we put it in a couple of years ago and it's never gone down. So we don't have any service, we don't have any maintenance, we're just running it and we're very comfortable. We've got some in-house support. And it's an interesting topic because if you think back to four or five years ago, the philosophy of if I have that kind of capital locked up in a mainframe, why would I ever not have service or support on it? And I think it really speaks to the reliability and the availability of open source software. Coming back to the code is really very, very good. And the code is really what's driving the behavior. And people are taking on different things in whole different ways. And not to say they're taking risks, but they're looking at things and they're saying, I've had this running, it's run very well. I'm not concerned about service or support or maintenance. I'm looking at doing different things with it. And I think it's a fascinating way of how the market is changing. This was a, uh, a study that uh, actually OSDL commissioned with IDC a couple of years ago. And the reason we did it was really to look at not only the Linux operating system and the growth that it was expected, but we were looking for a consistent number that IDC was using to kind of forecast what was going on in the market. Now there's a couple of terms that I think are pretty, that are pretty interesting on here. First of all, when you look at from 2004 to 2008, uh, that number grows to about $36 billion as a market uh, for servers and for PCs and for packaged software. The more interesting part, I think, than the $36 billion is if you look at the software that's running on top of Linux, goes from about $4 billion to about $14 billion. The other piece of that is in that $14 billion, 
over $2 billion of that is open source software. So what that says is, in a very short period of time, the open source software market grows from next to nothing to about a $2 billion market worldwide. Now, the first question people ask is, well, yeah, but the software's free, right? So how could there be $2 billion for free software? Now, we all know that while the software may be available off the internet, it's not public domain. It does come with a license. In, as I tell people, 99.9% .9 of the world needs help. They need help with the deployment of software. Now, whether that's education, whether that's training, whether that's service, whether that's support, whether that's subscriptions, what, whether that's customization, it gets to the point of the business models are changing. It's not to say software drops out of the internet and everybody uses it and it's free for everyone, because unless you're at a technical level and a development level, to be able to use that, that's one thing. But the vast, vast majority of the world will need help in this area. So there's tremendous opportunity for the businesses, um, as well as tremendous opportunity for the whole market, if you will, to adopt open source software. The other thing about this chart that has been so interesting, um, I recently was at the, the Gartner conference, and Gartner talked about the software market. The software, the total available revenue for the software market in 2005 being $177 billion. And they talked about in 2010, it being a $270 billion market. So the software market goes up by over 50%. And interestingly enough, uh, while they don't measure revenue associated with open source software specifically, what they said was about five or 6% of that $177 billion would be affected by open source software, meaning that they wouldn't necessarily, the vendors, if you will, wouldn't see all of that revenue because of the effect open source software was going to have. What was interesting was when they looked out in 2010, they thought the affected portion of that revenue of the $277 billion was over 16%. So what they said was while the market grew dramatically, the opportunity for open source software and the impact on the revenue was growing by 300% from the number that it was originally at. So I think it speaks volumes to where Gartner sees the market going for open source software and the market going for software on top of Linux and other operating systems. So it's not to say the operating system market is slowing down. It's not to say the software market is slowing down by any means. But what you're seeing is a realization from people like IDC and people like Gartner that the market is growing, the marketing is growing very rapidly, and the opportunity for open source continues to be very, very strong. Let me kind of show you kind of a, a pictorial of, of what has happened. From 2000, when those companies originally talked about testing the Linux kernel, one of the things that happened, and you probably all experienced this in your organization, was there was a lot of risk uh, processors and RISC hardware out there running Unix. And those, that proprietary hardware might cost, you know, anywhere from ten to fifty thousand dollars per unit, whether it was a workstation or a server. And the Unix operating system on top of that ran anywhere from six to ten thousand dollars per operating system license on each one of those servers. And then there was a set of middleware and there was a set of applications. Um, I refer to this as uh, kind of the Oracle model. If you think about Oracle and their unbreakable Linux strategy, what they really did was they took everybody and they said, look, you ought to move off your risk hardware and you ought to move down to off-the-shelf hardware, right? Whether that's Intel, whether that's AMD, whether that's power, you ought to move that way. And you ought to move from the Unix proprietary systems that you're running and you ought to move down to Linux. And you ought to be able to run Linux on your server for somewhere in the range of, you know, $100 to $1,000 per system. And, but keep all your middleware, keep all your applications exactly the same. So what you saw was companies like Oracle moving all their proprietary software on top of Linux, driving the hardware cost down, driving the operating system down, and keeping all of that software. What that has done is it has created, on the right-hand side, tremendous opportunities for the users to really look at okay, I'm now confident, I'm now comfortable with what Linux has done. 
I'm using stacks and stacks of blades. I'm using different servers. I'm looking at interoperability. I'm looking at virtualization. How do I start to use more open source into that stack? And as open source is moving into middleware and moving into infrastructure, it's creating additional investment opportunities for those customers, those agencies, if you will, where people are looking at whole new ways to invest in software. And they're doing it primarily through the open source model of how do they community, how do they get involved in the community, how do they collaborate, and how do they take advantage of that. They're also getting to do all sorts of new things. And this isn't a hardware conference, so I don't want to talk about you know, the hardware benefits that people have gotten. But th there are various stories about people that have moved from risk to off-the-shelf hardware and the Linux operating system from various distributions and the performance gains that they've made and things they just haven't been able to do. So let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, as you look at what governments are doing in the open source space, you're starting to see quotes uh, consistently around the world for what governments are doing, the roles governments can play, the, uh, the activity, if you will, the economic development around it. And it's probably an interesting point because one of the things that we see that's very, very interesting is kind of what's happening around the world. In the US, you know, I refer to kind of the, the adoption of Linux and open source software is it's really about business and money, okay? It's about users and it's about whether it's agencies or whether it's customers looking at how do they use more open source software. And it's really about price performance. It's about security. It's about reliability. It's about availability. And it's about getting more involved, if you will. If you look in Europe, the EU is much more actively involved from a social, cultural standpoint. They're very involved in, in various activities around uh, intellectual property. And when you look in Asia, the activities are very significant around economic development. It's not only the fact that the same number of servers are being used around the world, but people are looking at it differently. You know, if you look at Japan and you look at China, not only are there more people accessing the internet using cell phones and smartphones than there are accessing using PCs, but it's been that way for a number of years. And it's growing, and it's growing very rapidly. So you see a lot of governments around the world not only emphasizing the use of open source software and the participation in the communities, but also as a real trigger for economic development. How can they create an ecosystem where their countrymen and their countrywomen are developing software that can not only be used by their countrymen and their countrywomen, but also can be used around the world, and how do they participate in that? Uh, we're running a series of symposiums with developers around the world where they want to get more involved, they want to get more participative, they want to find out how to participate in the different communities. And it's something that, as Brian comes, Brian will spend more time talking about later today, the role of the communities and how do you get involved and how do you participate. The other thing that's talked about is, uh, IDC came out with this decreased cost in shared resources. It is, a, it is a phenomena that's really taking place where there are natural partnership opportunities. People are really looking at, once again, where are the common areas? How do we work together? How do we begin to foster that activity? And it's, been, and it's, and it's an area where people have looked at Linux, looked at open source, and said, this model works well, but we don't necessarily have the participants. We don't necessarily have the skills. And when they go out to the development community, they don't necessarily see it. So one of the questions we're starting to get asked a number of times is, well, how do we work, how do we work on this together? Uh, and I'll give you, and I'll show you some examples as we go through this a little bit farther. But the idea that common communities are being formed it's one thing to go out to the world and look for a community and look for a project and look for a set of code. It's another thing where people are saying, I've got some interesting expertise. I know I have a similar problem with other agencies or other governments or other cities. How do we start to work together? How do we start to collaborate? How do we start to get the benefits of, I'm investing a tremendous amount of money. Others are investing a tremendous amount of money. The most of what we're doing is the same. How do we get the leverage across that? So let me talk for a second about some of the things that are going on. As I said, I think there's tremendous opportunity to join forces with other cities and states. There's a shared dollars or shared budget, and, and whether it's staff or knowledge, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. 
Uh, once again, this idea of joint development. You know, people are comfortable in some industries doing joint development. In other industries, aren't, develop, aren't comfortable at all doing joint development with their competitors, with their peers. But what's happening is, is people are really looking at what are my core competencies and what's core to my business and what's context to my business. And in the areas of context, how do I find a way to collaborate on those? How do I free up more of my budget to work on my core competencies, my core issues, my key differentiators? And how do I look in the areas of context? How do I collaborate more on that? And how do I start to begin that process? And I think it's one of the things that, uh, that we've done here in Oregon that we've got started on. Um, it's with collaborations with some of the things that are going on in the state, some of the things that are going on at the Open Source Lab at Oregon State University, some of the things that are going on at OSDL with some uh, publicly traded companies, if you will. As an example, um, for the last four years, we've been working with Nokia and Alcatel and Ericsson and Cisco and IBM and Intel and HP and Red Hat and Monta Vista and Novell around what we called carrier-grade Linux. And as an example, if you remember back in 2000 and 2001, those telecommunication equipment manufacturers had a very serious, you know, they were in serious financial problems. As you recall, in, in 2000, they were uh, cutting expenses dramatically. They were laying off, you know, a third to a half of their employees. And they were looking for, as wireless infrastructure was coming into play, how do they do that? And one of the things that they did uh, as part of the OSTL work groups was they came together to collaborate on how do we work with the development community to get the kind of features and functions we need in the operating system to be able to use that in the wireless infrastructure space. Now these companies, you know, don't do joint development together and they compete fiercely in the marketplace, but they really compete at the upper levels of the application. But when you looked at the operating system and when you looked at middleware and you looked at applications, there was a great opportunity for strength and great opportunity for partnering. Now, a lot of that code obviously got written by the vendors and got written by the different development communities, but they created a set of priority projects and a priority requirements and priority functions. And they did that and then the community worked on it and it became a part of the operating system. And then as the operating system obviously advanced, the distributions, the Red Hats, the Monta Vistas, the Novells of the world, picked that up, made a significant amount of enhancements on it. And you're now at a point where about 90% of the design wins in the wireless infrastructure space around the world are requesting and requiring Linux as part of that. And it really came out of this collaborative work. Now, they never could have done it individually. They never could have worked with each of the vendors individually on either the vendor side or on the user side for this to come together. And it's a great example where an entire industry, if you will, got together and talked about cell phones, smartphones, wireless infrastructure, and how do we work together in that environment to really benefit everyone, to lower our costs, to improve our performance, to improve our availability, to, perform, to improve our reliability, and do it at a point where we can really overinvest, if you will, at the differentiators of wireless infrastructure and not at the core, at the operating system, at the hardware level. And I think it's a great example, and I think there's a tremendous number of examples of where we can do that. I talked a little bit about the EU activities. There's a lot going on around the world today. If you look at the EU's positioning on open source software, they have been very aggressive in the adoption, in the, in the legal issues, in the pushing and the prodding of their government agencies to get more involved in the use of open source software. We think that's critically important. Uh, the next one, uh, about two and a half years ago, the ministries of information industry of China, Japan, and Korea all stood up together at a single event and said, we are going to collaborate on open source software across our three countries. And those three countries have been meeting consistently to talk about how do they use open source software across those three countries. And it's not something that started last week, and it's not something that, while they announced it two and a half years ago, they don't meet on. They meet regularly, they meet with big groups. There's very specific groups in each organization. In Japan, there's the Open Source Symposium. There's a, uh, or the Open Source Promotional Forum. There's an Open Source Symposium in Korea. There's a similar one in China. And they work on their own individual activities, but they come together three and four times a year to work on regional issues. What do we do together? How do we work together? And it's created a fascinating environment where 
these three major, major countries and major IT markets around the world are looking for how do the governments work together? How do they collaborate on different applications? How do they collaborate on open source opportunities across their government agencies? And I think it's a fascinating model for where the world is going, where you don't necessarily think of the three countries working closely together like that. The other thing that's been interesting is, as you can imagine, there's a lot of countries in Asia that are not part of China, Korea, and Japan. So almost uh, six months to 12 months later, they formed this organization, the Open Source Symposium in Asia, which is a broad set of, I believe it's now 26 or 29 countries that are involved in similar discussions. So kind of if the big three are going to go work on this, how do we all work collectively on this? And China, Korea, and Japan are also participating in that broader activity. And they meet consistently. And, uh, and they get together and talk about what are the different issues in information technology, what are the different issues from an agency standpoint we deal with, and where are there opportunities for us to collaborate together. And I think it just speaks volumes to what is going on in that marketplace and what's happening around the world. The last one is this term BRIC, which is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and Korea. And these companies have, uh, these countries, excuse me, are all making significant investments in the desktop. Now, interestingly enough, they're not making the same investments, right? Some are looking at it from an education standpoint. Some are looking at it from an illiteracy standpoint. Some are looking at it from a, just a deployment of PCs. They're getting so many new PCs for the first time. How do they start to leverage the open source software that's out there? How do they start investing in economic development plans so jobs get created, so companies get created in their countries? Once again, countrymen and countrywomen working together to, to support the local rollouts of what they're looking for. I'll give you an example. In China, they have got, uh, there's probably 40 companies looking at educational software, K through 20. And they are looking at how do they replace the textbooks with laptops that they can roll out. And to give you a feel for the numbers, uh, we met with the Ministry of Education not too long ago. There are 250 million students in China, K through 20. And their feeling is the textbooks cost them $125 per student. And if they can get the laptop down to $300 per laptop, they put Linux, they put open source software on top of it, they will roll out 100 million laptops the first year. And they think they're probably two or three years away from that. They would eliminate the textbook, they would roll out the laptops, and they would get to 250 million students. Now, the, the numbers are mind-boggling, but it's interesting, when you ask them about it today, where are you against a $300 laptop with all this software? They will say they're at about $400, $450 today. So they're not that far away from it. They think it's coming. They think there's a tremendous opportunity for them to get there. What's fascinating, the other thing that's fascinating about it was, uh, as somebody who had been in the, in the PC industry for a short period of my time, the, the logical question I asked was, well, how big is the laptop market in China today? Because uh, I wanted some reference for what is 100 million incremental laptops to K through 20 students in a year. Well, the market for laptops in China right now is about 20 million units in a given year. So they're talking about going from 20 million units to 120 million in a single year where 100 million of those go to K through 20 students. And they want to do it with software, all open source software, all Linux based. Ideally, you know, coming from their country men and their country women, but they not only want to do that there, they would like to roll out that educational software. And they are looking to collaborate with people all over the world on educational software because they see this as a huge opportunity. Similar things that are going on in, in Brazil and in Korea where there are various projects in place. How do we begin to use open source software on PCs for people that are getting PCs for the first time? You know, they have internet access, they have cell phones, they have smartphones, they're getting access to software in a whole new way, and they're, they're constantly looking at new ways to go about this. And I think from a, from a standpoint of what we're doing around the world, once again, I think we have a great opportunity to get involved in a variety of different projects, not only here locally, but I think there's a great opportunity to partner with other cities, other countries around the world. So let me talk about a couple of things that's happening in the United States. 
Uh, one of the things is the Veterans Administration. I think Larry Augustin is here later today talking uh, a little bit. He's the chairman of MedSphere. You know, the Veterans Administration is an interesting, they wrote a tremendous amount of hospital software code that over time they open sourced all of that code and a company, MedSphere, that Larry is the chairman of, he'll talk about that. But one of the things that that has done is it has created a whole application suite and a whole set of software around what can be used in hospitals. And it's something that came from a in-house proprietary set of software that got developed, it got open sourced, and it is now rolling out and has the ability to roll out and kind of leverage the work that they've done in other places. And I think it's a tremendous opportunity of where things are going. You also see uh, NASA. NASA recently made some announcements about what they're doing with Linux, what they're doing with open source, and the collaboration across that. I think it's very, very important that we look at different pieces of that. The other area is in the Department of Defense. Uh, you, most of you probably saw a study that came out where the Department of Defense really aggressive, aggressively recommended that people start to use uh, Linux and open source software in various different projects. And I think you're starting to see a little bit of kind of tops down where major organizations, major agencies are looking at how do we start to use open source software? How do we start to push that into the marketplace? And it's not, it's not throw out proprietary software and use open source software. It's evaluate open source software. It's look at where open source software makes sense. It's look at where your budget is today, where you're spending money, and how do you leverage? How do you work on that together? And I think that's really the message. I think when people get into trouble, they kind of flip too far, right? They go from the everything was proprietary, so everything should be open source, and if you're not, you're old school. You know, it, it comes down to something that's, I think, pretty fundamental. Um, open source is a great process, and it's a great way of developing software. It's a great model for community and for collaboration and a variety of things. But it's not all things to all people. You know, if you remember that numbers that I showed you on the server market, the number more than triples of the software running on top of Linux, but about two billion of that is open source software. So I think you have to keep it in context. I think there's tremendous opportunity to once again to leverage your core investments at the same time share on more of the context level. Let me talk about a couple of things that are going on uh, here in Oregon that are kind of near and dear uh, to our heart as local Oregonians. One of which is the help desk. Uh, and there's a help desk project going on in the state where the agencies are beginning to collaborate on how do they do help desk? How do they work on that together? Instead of different help desks in each of the agencies, how do they work together on that? How do they collaborate? How do they begin to build a community around that? And while they're at the beginning of this process, I think it's a great opportunity to look at that. The Open Innovation Center is something that I brought up that's a combination of ideas. Uh, Intel and IBM both being uh, headquartered, I should, should say, Intel's biggest facility here and IBM's open source activities is headquartered here. They are looking at doing a wide variety of things around innovation around the world in a various set of industries. And I think we have a unique opportunity to really to take advantage, if you will, of what I think we can do at a state level, what some things that Oregon State can do, what some things at uh, the Oregon University system with what Portland State's doing, what the University of Oregon is doing, what Oregon State is doing, together with the idea of this open innovation, this open innovation center to look at various activities within the government and really partner on that. So I think we're, we're positioned well to do a number of things in Oregon that not necessarily being done anywhere else in the world. And I think we can really be the model. And we'd like to reach out to you know, more people that are attending here in different parts of the country, in different parts of the world, on how do we start to build communities and collaborate around that. The other thing was the City of Portland Police Department. And I bring this up because uh, it's, an, it's an interesting story. They have, as you can imagine, a series of requirements with an information system that they have in place today. And they need to upgrade that. And they've got a budget in place for what they want to do. And in talking to them, they've looked across multiple cities and multiple counties within the state of Oregon about how they think they can collaborate together. They're also now investigating other sister cities, if you will other cities, other countries where they have the similar police issues and how do they begin to work on those activities together. Now they've got a lot of expertise, they've got money budgeted to do a lot of upgrades, a lot of enhancements, a lot of features, 
But if you will, there's a great opportunity here where they're going to spend the money anyway. And there's probably other cities and other states and other countries that are looking at the similar features and functions. How do they begin to work together on that? How do they begin to collaborate on that? How do they share some of that? The other area is uh, this, there's a distance learning program that's starting to go on in the state of Oregon. And, and distance learning is obviously a, a big hot topic in education everywhere in the world. But they are looking at, and the only way they think they can roll out education they want to is through distance learning because of the way the makeup of the state of Oregon is. I think once again, it creates a great opportunity for us as a local agency to reach out to other agencies around the country, around the world, to begin to collaborate that. So, you know, what does that mean? These are, these are just a few examples. And where I'd really come back to is the idea is, if you have money budgeted in a particular area, you ought to think about how do I collaborate with somebody? How do I partner with somebody? How do I work with somebody on that? Because I ought to be able to share resources on a common level on some things. There's some shared risk, there's some shared rewards, there's common development, there's joint development, but it's a very unique opportunity for people to participate. And I think what's been great about it is, is whether you look at Linux or whether you look at a variety of open source software packages that are out there today that are having tremendous success, operating system, middleware, infrastructure, at the user level, there's now the opportunity to move to the application level. And I think because of that success, people look at the ideas of community and collaboration and how do they begin to do that in an application layer. And I think there's tremendous opportunity for not only cost savings, but benefits to everybody where they couldn't do it themselves, they couldn't do it on their own. So let me spend a, a second just kind of concluding on that. I think there's a great opportunity here. I think you can access your solution stack, but you got to figure out where you can collaborate, where you can't, and you got to figure out where those lines are. You know, something that, uh, that one of our uh, customer advisory council uh, members said yesterday in a panel discussion, he talked about uh, control the rate of adoption. You know, you've got to implement open source at a rate and pace that suits you, right? It has to be comfortable with your agency, it has to be comfortable with your organization, it has to be comfortable with your infrastructure. It's like anything else. You know, you can't get out ahead of yourself in the way you deploy software. If you deploy a project and you don't meet the needs of the users, right, it doesn't make any difference whether it was homegrown, whether you bought it, whether it was open source. So you have to do it with the right rate and pace. The other thing about open source software is a lot of it comes in organically. Uh, you know, a lot of CIOs talk about how they thought they had a few pieces of open source code running in their IT environments, and they find out they got, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 different projects running. And they've got different people and working on different things, and they didn't know about it. You have to think about that. You have to think about it in context of what you have in your environment, and as you roll it out, you have to roll it out at your own rate and pace. The other area that comes up all the time is the legal issues. There are legal issues around, you know, as you develop software, which license are you going to use? How do you participate in that license? How do you participate in the deployment? If you give back, how do you give back? Obviously, it's at a market that people understand this and people have been, uh, have looked at this very, very carefully. Almost every vendor in the world is participating in open source projects. So they've all figured out internally how do they participate in open source projects without giving away their intellectual property. So they all have processes in place, as you can imagine, for doing that. Users have to do the same thing. Users have to look at how do their IT professionals, how do individuals participate? What are the roles? How do we want to do this as an organization? It certainly can be done. It can be done everywhere around the world. Uh, the market is growing and growing very rapidly. But you need to be cognizant of these things, and you need to work through these things. Because it is one of those things where, as you change paradigms, right, you have to do it carefully. You have to do it in an organized manner, because people are looking for you to trip up, right? So you need to look at that model. You need to make sure you do it carefully. And I think you do it at a, at a speed that meets what you need. Well, in conclusion, I really want to thank everybody uh, for the opportunity to talk to you today. I also want to thank everybody for coming to Oregon. I think we've got a tremendous opportunity here in Oregon to work together. Uh, I think that the state and the cities and the counties and Oregon State and the, uh, the university system 
as well as if you look at the companies that are here from IBM and Intel and HP and Sun and Oracle and the Open Source Development Lab, when you look at the, the kernel developers here like, uh, like Linus Torvalds who works for us, but some of the key subsystem maintainers, some of which live here that work for companies like Red Hat and work for companies like Novell that don't necessarily have a big presence here but are participating in the activities here, I think that is very, very important. And then there's a tremendous number of open source projects that are going on in the state of Oregon. And, uh, and I'm sure you'll be hearing from a number of them over the next day and a half. But I think we have a real nucleus of skills, not only at the operating system level, the middleware level, the infrastructure level, but at the application level. And I also think we're uniquely positioned to start to bring people together to learn how to collaborate, how to build communities, how to host projects and some of the things at Oregon State, how to begin to work on this frontier, if you will, together. So thank you very much for your time and thanks for coming.